QDM came out of Texas and it originated literally with Al Brothers and his partner. Al was a biologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife and then went private. And Al noticed that older bucks had bigger antlers and that fawns are born on about a 50-50 ratio, 48 to 52 either way is kind of what we consider a skewed fetal sex ratio. So they're pretty balanced, but our harvest was grossly slanted towards males. In some states, 95% males and 5% females after doe harvest was allowed. And, and Al realized that was wrong. And so on a ranch where he was working, he got a small segment of land. There's again, a great book on this. And, and he started allowing some bucks to get older and they were getting bigger. Same habitat, it was just, you know, deer get bigger, even on low quality habitat, they get to live a few more years and harvesting some does. And he formulated the thoughts and the title of the, I haven't read it on my shelf, the title of the book is Quality Deer Management by Al Brothers and Murphy Ray. You can still get a reprint of a great read. Hello everybody and welcome to the Hunt Science Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Lance, a professionally certified wildlife biologist and natural resource professional college professor and owner of Land Source Consulting. The Hunt Science Podcast is dedicated to bring you the latest information on popular habitat management topics, wildlife science, hunting strategies, and the general conservation and land management practices to help preserve our natural resources. Thank you for joining us today. We are excited to have you with us and hope that you enjoy today's episode. With that said, let's get started. Grant, how you doing, sir? How you doing, Morning, sir? sir. Morning. Can you hear me okay? Let me get going here. How about now? Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me okay? I, I do. I do. Awesome. So how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Thanks for coming on. I'm a new show, so it's kind of like I still get these people on. I'm like, okay. It's, it's yeah. So it's pretty cool. So I appreciate yeah. it. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so I saw I heard your episode, my buddy Mitch over at Pennsylvania Woodsman. So I've, uh -huh. I've been following you for a long time. So yeah, you were one of the guests that that's on my hit list, if you will. You know, when I started my show. So yeah, when I was talking to Mitch, he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna have Grant on." I was like, "Cool." I was like, "That's pretty cool." I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna have to get him on too." I was like, "I moved you up." I, I had a, a lot of the guys. I'm like, "Well, I'll wait a little bit till later." You know, my show has been running for a little while before I started reaching out to some of the some of the bigger names. But I was like, yeah, worst they say is no. But thanks for coming on. So I appreciate it. Oh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Are you originally from Pennsylvania? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm an Ohio boy, born and raised. Yeah. So Northeast Ohio is where I live. Uh, I'm a wildlife biologist up here. Um, I work on the consult. I work on the private side. I have my own company. I do a mm -hmm. lot more. I do a lot of environmental permitting, you know, for utility companies. I do threatened and endangered species work, that kind of stuff. But you know, the, the game, the game species is always my passion. You know, I, I do a lot of waterfowl stuff. Okay. I'm actually going to be doing, uh, I'm going to be probably going into a PhD program here next year, okay. you know, doing some waterfowl research. So I'm kind of shifting away from the deer and the predators. And mm -hmm. I got into waterfowl a couple of years ago, Dr. Lebretsky from the university of Texas. Um, I don't know if you know who he is. He, he's done a lot of genetic research. He's a wildlife geneticist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's done a lot of work with mallard population. So I belong to the Delta Waterfowl, our local chapter here. And about a couple of years ago, I got involved with doing their hen house studies that they were doing. And we kind of started ramping that up. And I've been thinking about a PhD. And I was like, all right, so we're going to do we're going to do some work with that. But anyway, well, good, I was like, it's going to be you. hard. It's it's going to be hard at the end of that. Because I'm like, once I get a PhD in a waterfowl you know, doing waterfowl research. I'm like, can I really call myself a deer biologist <laughs> anymore? Like it's going to be one of those where you're like, Ugh. but anyway, so kind of give you a rundown. What I was thinking about talking about was just, you know, like I do with all my guests is an introduction. I mean, I know a lot of people know who you are, but you know, there might be people that don't, you know, what led mm -hmm. you down the path to, you know, being mm -hmm. a deer researcher and then talk, I want to talk a little bit about you know, because you're one of those guys, one of the OG guys that were around in the early days of deer management and everything like that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, when you were going through grad school, what your deer, what deer research was like back then, what was kind of the mindset around it, and then move into, you know, when you started, you know, really seeing a bigger shift on the private landowner side for this kind of need for and this desire to want to start managing their properties. Mm -hmm. um, kind of get into that a little bit. And then, you know, I want to discuss with you because, you know, following you for so long, you have a, a very big, you know, deer management program that you do on your property. So I want to talk about, 
you know, setting up a successful deer program on your property, you know, where people in like year one, what should your focuses really be on, you know, magazine articles aside, like where should you most bang for your buck and, and you know, no pun intended, but kind of you yeah, know, go yeah. that route. Um, you know, priorities, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how you handle like data collection from like camera surveys, harvest data, observation, stuff like that. And then we'll kind of wrap it up, touching a little bit on having a deer program, but also managing for multiple species. I know you plant stuff for doves and things like that. So, you know, upland game bird, you know, here in Ohio in the Midwest, you know, the turkeys are a big one, you know, and a lot of people just kind of think I can manage for deer, especially with timber stands you know, and they, they, the veg, the understory gets too tall and it's not really conducive for a lot of turkeys. Right. So kind of understanding, you know, those things. Um, and then maybe, you know, how you handle predators a little bit, you know, we don't have to go into a huge discussion on predators because we could spend, you know, ends amount of time, you know, so that's kind of where I wanted to go with it is talk to you, you know, really kind of have the focus being around the early part of what was research like back then, how were the States handling deer management, you know, and kind of how that, system grew into what we see today and now that people are listening how do we approach managing you know and putting a program together on our property i'll Sound follow like your lead i'll follow you <laughs> all right all right we'll get going here let me take a drink i tend to drink a lot of water all right all right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Hunt Signs Podcast. Special guest today, we've got with us Dr. Grant Woods from Growing Deer TV. Dr. Grant, how you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on today's episode. I've been following you for a while, um, reached out to you. You know, we set this up rather quickly. Um, but I, like I said, I'm, I'm excited to have you on because I wanted to get a, a topic really focusing around the early days of deer management and what the landscape was, if you will, when that happened, you know, as a biologist myself, you know, I came up in the day where we've got all this technology, you know, deer management and, and wildlife ecology, you know, and how we study it and everything is, is so uh, I'm sure way more highly technical and advanced than what it was like back in your early days of grad school. So I'm always fascinated just from my own perspective. And I'm sure it's interesting for other people's to hear as far as how things were back in the early days of, of deer management. And then I wanted to shift into and, and discuss anybody who's been following you, you know, uh, anybody in the deer world, I'm sure know, has heard your name in some way, shape or form. Um, but you have a very successful deer management program. You get a lot of students that come through and everything like that. So I wanted to bring someone on that has been through the early days of deer management, how to manage a property, and then kind of focus this on, you know, obviously people that are, are already managing their property, but those people that are new to it, and maybe they got a new piece of land and go, hey, where should we really be starting? Okay, so that's kind of where I want to take the episode today. But first, like I always do, I'd like to introduce the guest to everybody. So why don't you take a moment to uh, tell everybody who you are and what led you path down the path, excuse me, to becoming, you know, Dr. Grant Woods, a deer researcher and where you are today. Yeah, you know, I think I was really blessed early on. I was raised on a small farm here in Missouri. I'm talking in Missouri, southern Missouri down by Branson uh, and a little hundred acre farm and I'm 62 or will be soon. So back in the day, farms were, you know, two acre fields here and a big fence row and three acres there and a big fence row and fence rows were kind of in me because they kept creeping in the field. So in hindsight, it was incredible wildlife habitat, food cover, food cover, food cover, all juxtaposed next to each other. And there were no deer in the county where I was raised. I'd never seen a deer, deer hunting wasn't the thing. And I'd heard, I wish I knew where, but barbershop or somewhere when I was in the first grade, they were going to restock some deer in the county where I lived. And that just really stuck in my mind. And I had a little trap line. My dad and I would take, you know, scrap barn wood or something and build little rabbit traps. Uh, and they'd be, a, you know, a rectangle and you'd have a hole in the back with a stick down the line and you'd whittle a notch and stick and it'd go up and over a stick. And then there'd be a door and the rabbit went in and went to the apple or whatever and hopefully knocked your stick up and the door would fall down, hopefully. And so I was running my trap line. Of course, I thought it was a big Yukon trapper, you know. I'd have to do my chores. We had cattle and pigs and go run my trap line. And I found a female fawn in one of these little fields that had been shot in the head. And from that day, literally that day, that moment, I have loved deer and really dislike wildlife lawbreakers. Uh, you don't want to trespass on Grant Woods land. You just don't want to do that. That's happened, and it's, it's not pretty for someone. So... um 
you know, I was first guy in the family to go to college, went to local college, didn't know what I was doing. They had a zoology program and I'm taking general botany and general chemistry and all that stuff. And but I took everything somewhat closely related to wildlife and was able to go from there to the, and I worked, by the way, I volunteered for those young people that don't want to do this. I volunteered to a program called SCA, Student Conservation Association, still after today. And I worked in Nevada, first time out in the Rocky Mountains uh, with mule deer and just happened to have a great boss, worked for the BLM, Bureau of Land Management. Before BLM was Black Lives Matters, it was Bureau of Land Management, folks. So it's OK to say BLM. And 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 that boss was a good conservationist. And of course, it's on a large scale. Nevada is 87 percent public land. Nevada's a huge state. Eighty seven percent of it's public land. A lot of people don't realize that over here in the east. And in Nevada, still to today, you don't just go to Walmart and buy deer tag. It's 87% public land, small population. And if you're lucky, you draw tag about every three years. Horribly mismanaged, incredibly overgrazed. But I had a good boss. He saw that. He saw the big picture and the lessons that gentleman, Kurt Ballantyne, poured into me that summer as I was volunteering and doing grunt labor, you know, driving fence posts and doing, taking forward samples, whatever, uh, really cemented into me good science, not science to publish, but good science and good research and how we can help wildlife. Of course, it was public land, but we were doing, trying to do habitat work around cattle on large public land, 100,000 acre tracks. And, and we did it one project at a time, this basin, this, Quarter mile, quarter mile of stream zone. And that was my foundation for what I do today. And that experiences and other things got me in the University of Georgia and then Clemson. And back in the day at University of Georgia, still a powerhouse wildlife school, you'd walk down the hallway in the spring and all you heard was turkey calls. I mean, all us grad students were hunters. We were hook and bullet type students, <laughs> game animals. And yeah. so everyone would be practicing their turkey call, boys and girls. And you know, it was very much a game species. That's changed a lot at that school and other schools today, which is okay. And I, But I've always been fascinated with deer. And my first research, my master's was on straight behavior of deer on public land. Uh, and I would sit in trees without tree stands. They were just kind of coming around literally. I didn't have budget for them. Climbing trees, hanging on a limb, trying to record deer in a scrape. And, and then my master, my PhD was much broader on human dimensions related to quality deer management. That term had just come out, Lily. Al Brothers coined that term out of Texas. If you haven't read that book, his book, Al Still Alive, great book. And uh, started meeting some of the world-renowned deer biologists. And that helped me formulate my own thinking. Uh, and at that time, it was just starting passing up bucks. That was unheard of before then. And harvesting does, which was really unheard of. And while I was in that program, I was that good kid raised by a great family. So I didn't steal the pencils from the supply office. I paid for my copies. So secretaries liked me. Big lesson there, folks. And timber companies would call in and want a program or some work on their land that was too small for universities. So secretaries would say, hey, we got this PhD student that might help you. And that's how I started doing private consulting. It was just a way. It wasn't to make money at all. People think it was, but it was just a way for me to get to go do not just textbook, but go do. And no one else was doing, so I had a wide latitude. Anything that made an improvement looked really good because there was no not much competition. Uh, you know, if you're in a race by yourself, it's easy to win. So uh, that's how I got started in a quick form, and I wouldn't change a thing of it. And then by the time I finished my PhD, I had a big enough client list, and and I'd seen, you know, professors have issues with deans or sometimes you couldn't really do what you thought was best for the resource because of some policy somewhere. And that never fit me well. So I just started consulting, think, well, I'll go teach at university later. And I just never looked around. 33 years later, I'm still consulting. So that's my story. Yeah, that's fascinating. There's You said a lot of things in there that we could go in different directions. The first thing, the first question I have you know, over in, in your neck of the woods, you know, you said growing up, you really didn't see any deer at all. You know, you haven't seen, you know, what was the major reason for that? I mean, I'm assuming it was habitat related. Um, you know, what was the major landscape like back then? Was it Yeah, just no, it, it was, it was fragmented and. 
No, it was actually better habitat then. These small farms, it wasn't subdivisions and, you know, wasn't all cow pastures. People still thought they could grow a crop down here in the Ozarks. Awesome quail hunting. There were quail everywhere. Matter of fact, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, the reason Walmart is headquartered in Bentonville, Arkansas, is because the founder of Walmart was a huge quail hunter, and that was awesome quail hunting. There's not a quail in counties around her now. So it was incredible habitat. Deer had been hunted out, chased out by dogs, whatever, uh, hunted out and um, not hunted, poached it, lo- long ago, not in modern times, long ago. And and the, I lived through the restoration program. People your age read about it in the textbook. I lived through restoration <laughs> and people were yeah. trapping deer and restocking them in different areas. And so I lived through that restoration. There's a great genetics lesson. There's all this, candidly, a lot of nonsense absolute nonsense about deer genetics. Uh, so uh, there's a couple of stories I'll share real quick here that will put that to bed, hopefully forever for listeners anyway. But um, what we can do here in Missouri is there were three refuges that had deer populations, state-owned properties that had deer in Southern Missouri, one about 20 minutes from where I'm sitting right now, hills and hollers and hardwood trees. And they took deer from there and started restocking the northern counties in Missouri, where now they produce world-class deer. And there were no deer up there, none, zero, not the occasional deer, no deer. And we're restocking. So 95% of deer, I think, if I remember the number right, come from these southern Ozark counties that have really small deer traditionally and, you know, small antler size, whatnot. And those same genetics as opposed to groceries are world-class deer. Or in Georgia, all the big deer back in the day come from the Piedmont before the government paid farmers to plant basically CRP pines. All the record book deer, a lot of Boone and Crockett's. And now if you look at the records, most of those deer come from southern Georgia where there's pivot irrigation and not many from those pine trees because it's a closed canopy forest. There's no groceries. It's never been about genetics, folks. It's been about habitat. And the evidence is overwhelming on a big scale, not a little test plot at a university a giant scale. So that's just a great lesson that's been shoved under carpet somehow. It's not about genetics. It's about habitat. And I saw that. I lived through that. And that kind of helped me in the habitat. So at my property here, again, in the Ozark Mountains, my wife and I bought no burnout cattle ranch. I've never seen more dead cattle skeletons on any property I worked than here. Literally, that's how bad it was. Cattle were starving to death. And now we've harvested 170 inch deer. And a county line happens to split my property. And in both those counties, the record was a 131. And now we have 170 inch deer. So it's it's just about habitat. Yeah, that's that's something I see a lot too. And and people, you know, even when I deal with people where they're they're seeing smaller deer and and a lot of times we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about the deer programs, as far as you know, this is why I, I really preach to people, you know, you really need to be taking data you know, harvest data and everything like that on everything that you harvest. I mean, even if it's does, no matter what it is, and start looking at weight trends, start looking at, you know, all this different biological data that you can easily get. You don't need to be a biologist to be able to look at that, you know, and and you go to start making decisions, say, hey, my habitat, I need more food, need more groceries, like what you're saying, you know, a lot of it. And I've said this on multiple episodes, you know, talking with other biologists and stuff. I, I think when it comes to habitat management, I think people just overcomplicate it. You know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, they look at things which, you know, can be a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing that they're that they're stimulating themselves and as far as their minds, as far as, you know, uh, how to approach the problem or or even just the management that they're doing. But I think it's a problem, too, that there's just too much information out there. And sometimes, you know, vetting the sources, you know, people don't do they see something published and like, hey, you know, on YouTube, and they're like, let's try this, you know, or whatever, without taking anything into consideration to where, you know, I'm not going to manage, you know, Northeast Ohio, like you do in the Ozarks, you know, there might be some similarities. Right. And they're probably maybe a more than, you know, you can put a percentage on that. But by and large, you know, if if someone's planting something in a vastly different area, I need to kind of before I just blindly do that, I need to take a look at it and be like, hey, is this something that, you know, I should do on my property, you know, as far as that goes. So I think when it comes to, to management, people overcomplicate it and they just they overlook the obvious where it's like, hey, it's smacking you in the face. What the issue is, you don't have habitat. You don't, and if you don't have habitat, it's either you have poor cover or you have poor food or both. You know, here we're not limiting in, in food. We're limiting in, in cover. 
Mm-hmm. You know, most of the time where I see people, people are complaining they don't see deer and they immediately push it off on the state. Where like in Nevada, where you worked, where it's eighty seven percent publicly owned, here we're ninety seven percent privately owned. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like the state is responsible for five, you know, plus or minus percent of the land base. So I always tell people, I'm like, be very careful. Like you're passing judgment and it's like, what are you doing? Like you've got 40 acres, you know, what are you doing to manage for deer on your property? It's like, I look around and I see hard 90 degree edges between the timber stands and either, you know, row crop areas or early successional areas, whatever it is. And I am like, you know, you don't, you're out here on four wheelers all the time. Your dogs are running all over the place. You, th- there's a lot of things that I start checking boxes to where I'm like, you know, be, you need to pump the brakes a little bit before you start casting blame, you know, in other areas. So it, it's a good point with habitat. And it, I hope people listening, you're hearing the theme here. <laughs> it's like, you know, you got to have habitat before you can start looking at anything else. Yeah, that was, my, I think that was my, could- that was my little, uh, Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I that think was my little you rant. can really simplify that. It, no, no, no. It, it, it's all good. If you can, you can even simplify that more. It's just real simple. Uh, we all learn this as children. There are no magic beans. So when you see that one magic plan or one magic technique, there are no magic beans. It's pretty simple. You need to start at the ground up and it all starts with habitat. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's back it up and, and and talk about grad school. So, you know, like I said, you know, you said you're 62. And, you know, going back through grad school for your time was was vastly different than mine. So what was the landscape like back then as a graduate student? Because, you know, you hit on something there a little bit too. So I, I, I teach at a university as well. I teach in the Department of Biological Sciences. And we don't have a traditional wildlife program. We have a conservation program, but it's mm-hmm. basically a biology program. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my stu- I teach the the upper division kind of special topics courses, wildlife resources, forestry, those kind of things. Um, I get students that come through that want to do more wildlife or you know that type of work. And there's a lot of universities that have shifted away from that or really have never gotten into that. I'm trying to do what I can to push more, you know, game species management. Like I'm proposing a course for waterfowl and upland game birds, and I'm trying to, you know, do these things. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, when we go, what it was like back then, because even today, you know, you're not seeing the shift. Like when I look at organizations out there that publish magazines, you know, societies out there, a lot of the emphasis is it seems to be, and I could be wrong on this, but it seems to be that it's skirting around the game species management side of, of wildlife management. So, you know, that worries me a little bit with the shift. Um, but back in the, your early days in grad school, what was the culture like around wildlife management, deer management in general? Yeah, well, uh, wildlife programs, true, uh, True wildlife programs, not a zoology program or something like that, were hooking bullet species because that's what was funded at the time. And what has changed is there's much more funding now in non hook and bullet or hunted species. There's all kind of money for down south for the red cockaded woodpecker and endangered species of woodpecker, millions and millions, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Things so overstudied when the solutions are pretty simple. Uh, and so there's just more funding and colleges follow funding. It's just that simple. So there's more funding for non-game species. Unfortunately, most of that budget comes from game species. Uh, a lot of our schools don't even teach this anymore, but the Pittman-Robertson Act, those are those were a couple of yeah. congressmen back in the day, and they got it passed, what's called an excise tax, where in real simple form, manufacturers of hunting goods pay a, a tax, 11% tax. Before that product's ever sold. Now, we pay it. The consumers, hunters pay it. But that is what's funded most of the conservation work, not license sales, but the the Pittman-Robson Act is the biggest source of funding. Oddly enough, uh, through time, congressmen have tried to get that passed for like bird watchers, put that excise tax on bird feed or binoculars or, you know, stuff like that. Hikers, horseback riders, cross trail riders, you know, motorbike riders, whatever. None of those groups have ever passed it. They don't want to impose a tax to pay for it. Only hunters and fishermen have done that. Only yeah. hunters and fishermen have done that. So that's the telltale that we pay for others to enjoy. And you hear this that, well, we're not part of a consumptive sport, i.e., 
we're not killing the golden flicker we're looking at through our binoculars. But you drove out there, you walked the land, you maybe jumped a fawn or hit a, a bird nest or whatever. Everyone that uses the outdoors is a consumptive user, period, whether it ends with harvest or not. But those of us that are harvesting or attempting to harvest are paying the way. And that's an imbalance. Yeah. And politically, that's an imbalance in our current wildlife management. Yeah, that's something that, you know, I go through with my students in one of the courses I teach. We, we have whole sections on Pittman-Robertson. I mean, even, you know, how the, the duck stamp program started and just mm -hmm. all those different, you know, things that are out there. And, and I always and I always do that. It's funny you brought up the other groups because I always talk about that, too, with them. As I said, OK, you know, and I've talked about this in other episodes, you know, with Dr. Marcus and some of the other academics that I've had mm -hmm. on here. Um and because I, I'm curious as an educator myself, I'm like, you know, as I see these students coming through, you know, the hands are far and fewer between for those people that hunt, you know, and, and things like that. So but here they are in conservation programs and here they are in biology programs. And it's like they don't hunt. They don't have any interest. They have misconceptions about it. And I'm like that. That's a little bit worrisome. We'll, we'll leave that. So yeah. it rocks, you know, uh, it's just education. Yeah, it's just yeah. education, well, right? There's still some great schools. Uh, Mississippi State is a very hands-on wildlife oh, yeah. management school. Uh, Texas A&M at Kingsville, not the main Texas A&M, but Texas A&M at Kingsville is a very game-oriented school. There's still some really great schools out there. Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. And and I just try to hit hit with the students and, and like, listen, you know, you don't have to hunt. That's fine. But you have to understand exactly what you said is what we talk about is that, you know, if you're a bird watcher, you're using the parking lot that was paved on the wildlife management area. You're using the trails that are paved to go down to the river edge or whatever it is. I'm like, there are things that you may not be actually harvesting, you know, by going out there and fishing or going out there and duck hunting or whatever it is, but you are using resources that are put out on these public lands for everybody to enjoy. So like you said, you may not be the consumptive user, but you are using resources that are out there. It's just not that wildlife resource. So, you know, and I always ask, I'm like, who in here is a kayaker, right? Who in here is a hiker? Now how, you know, we have this, ta so it, it, it always is for a good debate, but a lot of people don't even, excuse me, a lot of the, the younger generation, even before me, and probably even a lot of my generation have no idea about the Pittman Robertson and they show up sure. on these wildlife areas and they see these, these bike trails and these horseback riding trails and these parking lots and these buildings like, where do you think that came from? You yeah. Know? So yeah. it's, it, it's always a good, it's always a good education. I, I would um, say just to finish that up, if you don't mind, the biggest yeah. change I see, I'm still oh, yeah. involved, adjunct professor, whatever, whatever. Um, I'd say the biggest change is the lack of practical experience. So used to a lot of farm boys went into wildlife management and they knew how to run chainsaw, drive a tractor, do whatever. And, you know, if you're a lab researcher, you're a geneticist, whatever, that is great. That's a major contribution to wildlife management. But if you're going to be a land manager for a state or federal agency or a NGO, whatever it is, you need to know how to use a chainsaw and how to sharpen a chainsaw blade. It's almost like the Mike Rowe dirty job thing, you know, and there's good money to be yeah, made, exactly. very secure jobs. You need to know how to hook up implements to a tractor. You need to know how to grease a tractor. And so I think the real shortage, and I visit with several state agencies, like Missouri Department of Conservation, for example, I know him well. The director of wildlife is a guy I knew in grad school. You know, he kind of took one path. I took another. We've stayed friends all these years. And there's a real shortage of finding qualified people to do the field work. A wildlife management is always going to require field work. Someone has to be doing prescribed fire or maintaining trails or making trails or planting food plots or planting, re replanting a forest after it's been harvested or whatever it is. Wildlife management is always going to require dirty jobs. And yeah, skilled people sure. that want to and can do those jobs. And, and and so wrapping up this thing about graduate school, to me, the missing link due to insurance and budgets and all these things is we don't have enough graduate students with tick bites on them. We don't have enough graduate <laughs> students that have actually been in the field. They are yeah. 4.0 students on a textbook, man. They know, the, yeah. you know, all these things. We need some people to be in the field. And every agency I yeah. work with, as a consultant or a friend or a buddy, again, I went to grad school with, he's now, a, you know, a director of some state agency or something. 
the first thing they ask me is, hey, do you have any interns I can hire? They need people that yeah. have that experience. Yeah. So if you yeah, want to get a leg point. up, if you're going in this field, uh, again, you can do what I did. You can volunteer for SCA. There's all these groups that are begging for help to implement field projects. And if you want to leg up, it's not the difference between a 3.8 and a 4.0. Uh, you know, grades are important, but that's not what's going to get you a job these days. What's going to yeah. get you a job is, you know, being on time and having some practical experience. That's what's going to be yeah. so important. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our primary sponsor, Landsource Consulting. Landsource Consulting is an Ohio-based wildlife and land management consulting company that I own and operate not only here in Ohio, but through the Midwest and beyond. At Landsource, we work with private landowners just like you to build and develop those property-specific management programs to help bring the goals that you have on your property to life. If you're interested in getting more information on who we are and how we can help you, please visit us over at LandsourceConsulting.com. There you can check out the different service packages and capabilities that we can provide. We would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out to us and schedule that free consultation either through our website or you can reach out to us and connect with us on our other social media platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. That's LandsourceConsulting.com, building relationships for a more sustainable future. Oh, for sure. There's nothing like waking up in the morning and, and finding a tick and you're like, ah, where the heck that sucker come from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I checked three times. Like, where did you come? Yeah, I was just on a podcast a week or two ago and, and a guy that I know asked me on there and we talked about, you know, how to get into the wildlife field. You know, and I basically said there's three ways, right? There's there's academics going to work, you know, going to work as an academic, going to work, you know, for the state or federal agency or working in the private consulting field. Now, that's a harder one. But, you know, since, you know, you're an educator and, and been around a while, too, and just like me, we'll, we'll kind of wrap this part up is, you know, you mentioned the volunteering. And and, and I and that's where I, I'd like to go with it, because, you know, I tell people exactly what you said, like when I teach forestry. We have a whole section on chainsaw safety, handling, how to sharpen a blade, you know, how to do a directional cut, how to do a plunge cut. Now, the university won't let me demonstrate it, <laughs> but I'll get YouTube videos that I like. I'm like, this is a plunge cut. This is how we make a hinge cut and properly fell a tree. You know, we go out there and I actually get them with, you know, collecting DBH and getting the height of the tree, yeah. and using, doing basal area calculations and, and sure. getting out there and getting your hands dirty, like you said, because there's a lot of students that I've known noticed in my short eight years that I've been teaching to where they don't know any of these things. They don't know how to calibrate a backpack sprayer. They don't know how to calibrate one of the little Scott's, you know, hand seeders or whatever yeah, it is yeah, that you're using yeah. with a tart. I'm like, if you don't calibrate it, like, how do you know what you're playing? Yeah, doing, right. Totally I mean, you've got to, you've got to, yeah, you've got yeah. to know. So that's always important for people listening. And it's even important out there for people who, who aren't in academics and they just are land managers. They got property, you, it takes time. You, you got to sacrifice some time and go to a farmer and, and say, Hey, do you need help planning something? I'd like to learn how to plant something, you know, type of thing. And just getting that experience because I did that early on when I, when I got out of, of veterinary medicine and, and, and migrated away from that, you know, I had a professor in school that was still my mentor today, but he was a retired NRCS conservationist, you know, guy, you know, guy like you that just, had all this field experience and knowledge and, you know, grew up on a farm and, and everything like that. And I said, Hey, I want to get into this. And he gave me the same advice. He goes, Hey, you got to go volunteer. So I called a company and, you know, I called every Monday and I said, Hey, what do you guys got going for the week? I said, I'd like to volunteer. And I would get job. I'd go do some wetland stuff, bird stuff, fish stuff. Like I got this diverse experience getting my hands dirty. And then when I made the transition and started applying for jobs, like, it was like that. They're like, oh my God, you know, my GPA wasn't a 4.0, but yeah, I could go yeah. out there and run a chainsaw. I could go out there and run a backpack shocker. I could do delineations. I could do all this different stuff. And that was, that was the game changer. So no matter if you're going into academics or you're managing your land, you've got to have this experience doing it, you know? So whether that's going out and learning from a, a local repair shop or just a good old farm boy in your area on how to sharpen a chainsaw blade, like, you know, that, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Early, the other thing I see too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. One of the things with the research and stuff back in, in that you that, I, that I've read published, you know, back you know, the you know, decades ago or whatever, you know, it just seems like there's a different breed, and you alluded to it. I mean, becoming being the outdoorsman, 
you know, because you had mentioned climbing up a tree. You didn't have funding for, you know, uh, tree stands and things like that. And to me, like that's something in and of itself is is being having the the biological or the scientific mindset. Because I, what's your experience with um, working with, you know, just people in general? It, it, to me, a lot of the time, it seems like there's just that lack of that scientific kind of mindset, you know, just saying, hey, here's the data. Here's a problem. Let's look at seeing if we can identify the problem or what changes we can make. Have yeah. you seen a lot of that over the, over the years? I mean, I think it's a mix of good and bad. Uh, there are some great scientists out there that stick to scientific, very simple scientific principles. I think the more complicated we make it, you know, you find some really new version of regression or many, many out there just to get published. I had a really good scientist tell me if I couldn't get published using basic stats, I probably was cheating the data somehow. And so I think it goes back to that basic understanding of scientific principles. We see something we want to work on. We come up with a null hypothesis. We come up with a hypothesis. We state ahead of time how we're going to conduct a test. We stick to that. Or if we alternate, we have to, we have to explain that. And, and I think the need to publish is a real thing and, you know, promotions and everything. So I think we need to go back. And I had a class at University of Georgia called Scientific Principles and happened to have a good professor. It doesn't matter class title. It always boils down to the person teaching it and the student what they want to get out of it. You can be the best professor out there. If your students don't care, it really doesn't matter. So yeah. bottom line, find a program that fits your goals. If you can afford to go there, you may not live next to a school that has a good waterfowl program if that's where you want to be. But find a program that fits your goals and dive into it. And then the students, one thing I would say when I did my master's, uh, there was someone working on plankton. There was someone working on permiscus or mice, if you don't know that term. Yeah. And I would volunteer when they were doing field work, I would go along. Hey, it was fun. You know, you're out there with some buddies, you're doing some cool stuff outside. And learning about those different things gave me a much more rounded education than just, well, I work with deer, that's all I'm doing. And I would say to graduate students out there, in your off-field season, no one has a field season year-round usually, in your off-field yeah. season, you're in the back of the van going with someone else's field project to learn about what they're doing or their techniques. There's been a lot of game changers, right? I was started in the era of radio telemetry, which in hindsight wasn't that accurate for what we were doing, triangulating and all that stuff. It, to GPS come in while I was in graduate school. Very expensive, just novel, just a couple of callers. But what a game changer. You know where the critter is within a couple of meters versus you're your guessing and doing a lot of math on a triangulation for radio telemetry. Yeah. So we're getting more that, and more now. advanced techniques. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You're getting more and more advanced techniques all over in, in, in electron microscopy and genetics. And all these things are really advancing. None of that negates the basic scientific principle. So even with these more advanced tools, which are wonderful in wildlife and cancer research, whatever, they're wonderful. We still have to stick to the basic scientific principles to do meaningful work. Yeah, you know, we're talking a lot about academics and, and this transfers over into just the, the landowner. You know, I've got a, a friend of mine who, you know, he's he owns his own land, bought uh, I don't know, a couple I think 30 acres, 40, I don't know, something around there, but he's re he really got into soil health and soil mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't have a science degree, but it just goes to show like, you know, you can train the mindset. And if you're going to be a land manager, I mean, the, most people that listen to this are, are going to be either hunters or people interested in managing their land. And it's, I, I'm where I'm going with it. Oops, bump my camera there. Where I'm going with it is I want, you know, just to tell people, and I, I, I kind of preach this all the time too, is the critical thinking aspect, whether it's you're trying to harvest that mature buck, you know, and, and you're constantly analyzing and asking questions and looking to make improvements and, and advancing your knowledge, whether it's that individual deer and how to hunt it, or it's in the case of my buddy who wants to better understand the basics, like you said, mm -hmm. of soil health 
and mm-hmm. soil principles without going and reading peer reviewed literature that's out there, but just listening to some, you know, presentations presented by an NRCS soil biologist, right? Mm-hmm. Just getting those or I mean, it's you the day of YouTube, it's 2023. Like I tell my students, I mean, you guys can learn anything online, you know, so the willingness to go out there and, and learn those things, because it better helps your critical thinking process. Um, so let's move into you had mentioned when the shift for quality deer management, this term kind of came around. Can you discuss and, and kind of briefly paint the way for what the the con the conceptual topics were around deer management prior to QDM coming on? Yeah. And then, you know, obviously what QDM is, because I don't think people realize the the change in there that QDM has not always been around. Yeah. So we were in a period of restoration. Pennsylvania started first. They had the, Pennsylvania had the very first game warden in America and kind of the first program. They led the way. Uh, but so we were restoring deer and there were no doe seasons in most states way back when. I, I in Missouri, in southern Missouri, I hunted when there were no, it was illegal to harvest any does, period. And so any buck was a fair target. And the goal was just to have enough bucks to reproduce with the does and let people enjoy the resource, get some meat, enjoy the resource, keep hunting alive. And then there's more and more deer. I clearly lived through, I remember clearly been through the first year we were allowed to harvest a doe and we all thought the world was going to end. Who would, who would even think about harvesting a doe? You had to be a sinner if you harvested a doe. And, 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 and then it become a slightly more accepted, slightly more accepted. And deer herds were getting too high in many areas. They were degrading the habitat, eating too much of native vegetation, damaging farmer crops, all these things. And, but QDM came out of Texas and it originated literally with Al Brothers and his partner. Al was a biologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife and then went private. Brilliant man. Uh, and, and Al noticed that older bucks had bigger antlers and that fawns are born on about a 50-50 ratio, 48 to 52 either way is kind of what we consider a skewed fetal sex ratio. So they're pretty balanced. But our harvest was grossly slanted towards males. In some states, 95% males and 5% females after doe harvest was allowed. And, and Al realized that was wrong. And so on a ranch where he was working, he got a small segment of land. There's, again, a great book on this. And and he started allowing some bucks to get older, and they were getting bigger. Same habitat. It was just, you know, deer get bigger, even on low-quality habitat. They get to live a few more years and harvesting some does. And he formulated the thoughts. And the title of the book, I haven't read it on my shelf, the title of the book, is Quality Deer Management by Al Brothers and Murphy Ray. You can still get a reprint of it. Great read. And and then Joe Hamilton, close friend of mine in South Carolina, was big buddies with Al. There's a big meeting. If you're into deer, you should go to it called the Southeastern uh, Deer Study Group. It's a science meeting, but open to the public. And it's the foremost meeting on deer biology on the planet, period. I've, I've spoken in other places. It's the foremost meeting. Yeah, I've been and, there the past couple of years. It's it's nice. Yeah. And so Joe, in different states, rotate hosting that meeting. And the year was to be in South Carolina. Joe invited Al to be the keynote speaker. And Al planted seeds that really took hold in Joe and some other people's mind. Joe was a wildlife biologist for South Carolina uh, Department of Natural Resources. And Joe started really preaching an evangelist, if you will, for quality deer management. And the principle is real simple. Let bucks reach at least two or three years of age and depends on your goals and objectives and harvest enough does that there's quality habitat for all the deer, fawns, bucks, and does. So you may need to harvest more in some areas and less in other areas. And those simple principles, um, were were the foundation of quality deer management. And Joe started preaching that, and Joe's a very social person. So we started at that time the South Carolina Quality Deer Management Association, which then grew in popularity and it went to the National Deer Association, and then just the QDMA, which is now the NDA. Uh, yeah. So that's the heritage of that in very brief, simple terms. And the whole thing was to better 
the understanding of deer biology and deer management so hunters everywhere could make a choice. And every time you pull the trigger or don't pull the trigger, you pass a deer, you've made a management decision. Maybe you're letting a buck reach an older age class or maybe you're passing a doe where does need to be harvested. There's not enough native vegetation there. And it's taken on all kinds of different avenues since then, but that was the gist of it. And it was based on the Australian Deer Management Association. There were no deer native to Australia. Joe had went there and spoke, and, and the Europeans brought deer into Australia, and they needed to be managed. And Joe founded the South Carolina Quality Deer Management Association based on what he'd learned in Australia. So that's the history. And I was blessed enough to be in on that. I'm like member, founding member number 18 of the Quality Deer Management Association. So I was able to nice. ride these shirt tails of Dr. Larry Marsh yeah. and Dr. David Gwynn, Joe Hamilton, Dr. Harry Jacobs, and just heroes and mentors of mine. Yeah, legends, man. Yeah. That had this vision. And I was the young graduate student just, you know, taking it in and willing to gut deer while they're talking, you know? So, yeah. um, so that really blessed me just to be in that era when deer management was changing rapidly and going state to state and listening to these evangelists just night after night of almost a, 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 a revival of deer management, if you will. And, it was a fascinating time. And, and quite candidly, back then, a seminar might have four or 500 people show up and get kind of rowdy because there were still a lot of people against harvesting does. Yeah. Fist fights were not unknown. You know, just huh. it, it, it was <laughs> yeah. it was a passionate time where now the arguments are different. Uh, and social media has taken all that out because it was face to face back then. You would go speak yeah. to a crowd. And as a consultant, you mentioned consulting two or three times. So, again, I was at Clemson, started helping some landowners. And a a founding board member of the Quality Deer Management Association, Robert Manning, who owned a bunch of pizza inns, was just a man that was very passionate about deer and got in with Dr. Marshall and Dr. Jackson and these guys. And they invited him into their group because he was so passionate about deer, well-read, well-studied. And uh, Mr. Manning went with me one day. I got invited to speak to a hunting club. I'll never forget this. They had an old house with no air conditioning. They set up a generator outside just so I could run my old slide projector inside this, what they called clubhouse, which was a dilapidated old house with no electricity. And think about 100 people in South Carolina in the summer with no fan. You know, it, it was had to be 150 degrees in there. And an old Kodak projector running. And I preach deer management and harvesting does and collecting data and the reason to pass up young bucks and the biology and all this stuff. And when it was over, the club took up a little collection, literally to pay this poor graduate student that shared some information with them. And I was hand out, ready to take it. I was a starving graduate student, right? Roadkill was on my menu frequently. And Mr. Manning, who's a big 6'4 man, just he's 81, doing great. I'm still in touch with him all the time stuck his big hand out and grabbed that money, literally, and gave it back to the club president and said, you know what? I'm sure Grant would rather you spend this money on the club and educating people than take himself. Of course, my eyes were wide and like, what are you talking about, man? That's groceries. (laughs) And Robert explained to me on our drive back that that sharing education was a privilege I had. And it later become a job, but a privilege I had, and that would pay dividends if I did good work and I told the truth and I helped people that it would pay dividends. And that, of course, has worked out true. So I I share this on to say, if you're starting out in your grad school or you're a new consultant or whatever, find yourself some good mentors. Be so careful who those mentors are, because I could have went wrong real easy. And I had yeah. great mentors that kept me on a good path. And I owe oh, whatever whatever little I've done to them. And deer management was different. And there was a, like always on any new trend, whether you're the first person to buy a Tesla or whatever, on any new trend, there would be a few forward thinkers that try it. And they take a lot of heat from the community. Oh my gosh, you're harvesting does. Or I can't believe you passed that buck because if you pass it, I'm going to kill it on my side of the fence. You still hear that story today, you know, and all this nonsense. And those few guys and gals that bucked the trend 
Well, now they're massive peer group leaders and their deer herd is so far ahead of anyone else's and their habitat is cooking on all eight cylinders. And I don't know for sure what the next trend will be. It will probably have something to do with CWD, chronic wasting disease. Yeah. Because that's a big battle we're facing. Um, but there's always these trendsetters, these people that are willing, they see the logic in it. And right now we're seeing this with regenerative ag. People see the yeah. logic in healing the soil and they adapt it. And soon, pretty soon into the cycle, they're more profitable than the other farmers that are dependent on all the synthetic inputs. And that heals the land, which makes wildlife better, makes the air cycle better, the water cycle better, the nutrient cycle better. And that is, the, I believe, in conservation. The future is regenerative bad because wildlife will be better if they're eating healthier. And anyway, it's fascinating to see these cycles come through. Yeah, no, the regenerative ag, I, it, it makes me happy because I, I didn't, the past couple of years, I haven't seen it in my area too much. And we've got some pretty big farms here and, and I've started to see it pop up a lot more. Like yeah. some of the spots where we, we get access to goose hunt and things like that. I'm like, look at that. I'm like, they're walking through. I'm like, this is all cover crap. And there's purple tops in here. And there's all, I'm like, okay. I'm like, nice. You know, and I, I struck up some relationships with these farmers, you know, over the past year or two, you know, especially. And uh, yeah, there's, it's good to see a lot of them going. And a lot of them have done their research too, you know, and, and I try to tell them, you know, we talk about them, like, it's not an overnight change. Yes. You know, I've actually had to talk a couple of them off the ledge of like, you know, going mass, you know, huge. I'm like, Hey, di let, let's dial it back a little bit. Like I'm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> if you can financially handle like a massively, you know, it's, it's going to take a little bit to build that, but the areas in which they're doing it are, are doing phenomenal, you know? And just like you said, there's so the benefits are just on and on and on, you know, I, I'm glad that's a trend that started, um, you know, and, and however people get into it, whether it's just because they're tired to spend the money on synthetics, Hey, whatever gets you into it, I'll take it, you yeah. know, but it is a, it is a good trend that I'm happy to see. Because, so there in your home you know, state you, of Ohio is a, a very famous farmer that's underspoken, David Brandt. And David's been doing this 30 plus years. It wasn't called Regenerative Vag when he started. And he's, he's in part of Ohio, Carroll County, that has a yellow clay soil. David's yeah. been doing this so long. He's built between 19 and 60 inches of black topsoil on top. He's one of the most profitable farmers in America. And he speaks to foreign governments. Foreign governments come and tour his farm. He's one of two places. You need to know this since you live in Ohio. Two places yeah. in the United States where the NRCS has reclassified the soil. The oh, soil yeah. is so different on his place than across the fence. That's literally now a different soil type. An academic, because I'm a big believer in practitioners. David Brandt's a, a practitioner. Gabe Brown's a practitioner. And David didn't go to college. He learned by trial and error and saw what was working and what benefited his land or, you know, whatever, his family. And, and now David's a world leader. He's literally a world leader. I've never seen David in anything but bib overalls. He's a world leader in ag, a world leader. And so let's don't just dive into textbooks. Let's have some practical experience. Let's do it. And let's go learn from these practitioners as well as the academicians. And David's yeah. creeks run clear. Even in a big torrential rainfall, they run clear. And you can see the videos where it runs into a stream coming off a neighbor's property. And it's wicked, wicked red or yellow, carrying so much soil yeah, down. I, I see so, that all the time. You there's know, so much hope for all the, the environmental yeah yeah doing all the environmental work that i do i see that all the time you know i see all the all the discharges and stuff it's like ugh. no i knew there was a farm in ohio that they actually reclassified the soils on. i just didn't know i just didn't know his name that's, yeah to that's put that in scale reach out to him yeah, yeah to put that in scale was i was in college we were all taught it took a thousand years to build an inch of soil that was the yeah. standard soil class and I think that's true. If you took a you know a piece of granite or limestone and put it out there on you know the Walmart parking lot, a thousand years it might weather down to be dirt. I don't know, you know. But when we have regenerative bag and life in soil bacteria, that's a whole other topic. Like at my place, we're building about a quarter inch a year. We build about a quarter inch of soil a year. And I'm in the Ozark Mountains, Stone County. You know how rocky it is when the county's named Stone, Stone yeah. County, Missouri. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and and that's one of the reasons we're growing better deer to neighbors or the neighborhood and all this stuff. So 
there is such a new field of science opening up, and it is so exciting that I think the cup is way more than half full. There's such a brilliant future for these younger students to to, to lock on to and new work to be done. And it, it went yeah. from, guys, do we harvest does? Or rec- more recently, last, I don't know, 10 years ago, we realized that twin fawns at minimum of 25% of the time are stepbrothers, stepsisters, that does often breed with multiple bucks. Takes the whole genetic picture out of out of context, right? You, there is no such thing as culling or selecting a buck to harvest, and, and that research is well published now. You, there is we, there's a great research, seven years of research off a very very large low fence ranch in Texas. They never had a 180 inch deer throw another big buck. They had a whole bunch of 120 inch bucks throw 180 inch buck fawns. That research is so well known, but it's not getting out there because. Mm-hmm. People don't want to talk. They kind of bust their bubble. Again, that's not a magic bean. They want that magic bean or that big stud buck producing more big stud bucks. But that's absolutely not how it works. Yeah. Let's let's shift over as we kind of get towards the end here. Let's shift over and talk about a deer management program on your property. Okay. Okay. So for the sake of time, let's kind of strip this back and look at this from the perspective of a new landowner a new, maybe a landowner that just new to a deer program and says, okay, I've got it. It's 2023. I've got all this information. I feel overwhelmed from your perspective of someone who has ran a program for decades, right? Where would you tell that individual as a general simple principle, like we've been talking about, where should real real that realistically, where should your first year priorities be focused on? Yep. My first year priorities are simply unexciting. They're in discovery. So I'm going to learn the neighborhood through Google Earth or whatever. And I want to see what's the limited resource in the neighborhood. You mentioned cover earlier. Is it food? We have food, cover, and water to deal with. Those are the elements we have to deal with. So is my neighbor a big soybean farmer? Then great. I got all the food my deer need during the summer, but maybe there's no food in the winter post harvest. So my first year is learning the property. That's job number one. And and learning the neighborhood. Learning the neighborhood. Year two is I started addressing that limited factor. I'm in West Texas and man, I need water. Uh, I'm in Ohio and I need cover, man. It's all crop fields around me. And once what I call the annual forest is harvested, all the corn and beans are cut. It's bare out there and they're, you know, deer going to cover somewhere. Uh, so my second year is, is my first big habitat project. Unless there's, you know, you got a bunch of autumn olive or something, you know, you got to start getting rid of these invasive exotics, um, is, is adding that limited resource that's in the neighborhood to help wildlife and help me as a hunter. You're going to go to limited resource. And then third, I'm going to look at my whole property acre by acre. And I may not be able to implement it in year one, but what are my priorities? Okay, I have a closed campy forest. I know I need to start opening the forest. Where's the lowest quality timber stands? Because I'm going to start with them. Because I'm going to see the biggest change. The the biggest improvement is going to start on the worst habitat because you can change it quickly. And your medium to better habitat, you can fine tune it later. And, And that in a nutshell is my approach uh, I'm going to learn the property. Most landowners haven't learned their property. I'm always amazed Well, I get there. Well, I've never walked in that valley. How could you own land and not walk at all? Um, no matter the size of the property. I'm going to add the limited resource, and then I'm going to find ways to fine-tune the better habitat. It can always be made better. I, I believe that none of us have ever seen a habitat that's in perfect shape, right? It can always be tuned up yeah. a bit more. So that's what I'm going to do. And a lot of this stuff doesn't have to be fancy. You can use a hatchet and a squirt bottle. You can hack and squirt. You can take out invasive species. You can use prescribed fire. If you're scared of fire, start with one acre. Almost all state agencies anymore have some type of fire training, fire program where you get education. Uh, you can hire contractors if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, but those that's my system. And that's what I did here. I didn't have that great a budget, certainly when I started. So it took me a lot of years to get there. And I started here in the Ozarks, cedar, eastern red cedar. 
uh, is very invasive, and it had filled up what were pastures back in the day. I never saw them except on old uh, plane images, aerial photography, not satellite images like we have now. And I started cutting cedars because that's something I could do. Chainsaw, file, some extra borrow of some gas and go cut cedars. Yeah. And, and they were the invasive species. That was the biggest problem on my property. And I just started felling cedars. Here's one last thing I'll share with you. And I, just, I read all the time, big reader. But I got, just got this book. I haven't read it yet, but I don't know what people say. But okay. Everywhere in America, there were explorers. Think like Lewis and Clark scaled way down. Everywhere in America, somebody was a trapper or whatever. And he wrote, he took notes. Find that book for your county and read it. And that will tell you what the habitat was before Europeans interrupted it. And you will do no better than restoring that habitat. You can't do any better than restoring that habitat. And in the South, yeah. that was, you know, open pine stands with a lot of space in between pine trees and all the grasses and forbs that were food and cover. And you figure out what that was in your area. Not what you see on YouTube that's up in Western Canada or something like that. Yeah. But like you referenced earlier, what was it in your area and work toward restoring that? Yeah, and that's the thing, too. Like I, I tell and I, I do this with my students is we get on, we'll pick an area. Uh, a lot of times I'll have them pick their own, like where they live or yeah, their hometown yeah. or whatever, and get on Google Earth and just sim and see how far back the images go. And just take notes and say like, hey, what? And a lot of times, you know, I'll have them take notes because I'm trying to get them used to observational data to say, oh, look, I know that that, oh, that, that's a McDonald's there now. But you know what? Actually, that, oh, man, that wasn't it. And then you start asking your parents, oh, I used to be a skating rink, right? Like if you go where I where I live now, the, the post office used to be a skating rink back in the day, but the big tornado in 84 wiped out half the town and it's like if you look back you know to those days you're going to see something massively different yeah you can see that with the land use on your property now you're limited to that the other thing i say and tell people is go to your local soil and water conservation district and get the old paper bound you know soil survey right because in those soil surveys they classify land cover systems and you can look at it what it was back in 70 whatever when it was published or, or anything so you can get those resources when you're saying to know your land walk in your land you know look at the apps that we have today you know the the mobile apps where you can mark scrape locations and trails and and pan that out and zoom out and say oh i see a pattern here yeah right? i yeah. see where they're coming from and looking from on here and then lastly i i always encourage people this and and not a lot of people do this is it's very easy to start collecting. It, it could just be in a notebook, your, your observation data. I could be out mowing the grass and be like, oh man, I, I saw three deer jump up. I don't know what they were, but at four o'clock in the afternoon, I saw three deer jump up. And then you just start getting in that habit. And at the end, you know, you're lucky enough, maybe you harvest a doe on your property. All right. How much did she weigh? Mm -hmm. You can buy a weight tape. You know, I showed my buddy not too long ago, uh, this last hunting season, a weight tape. You know, I was like, listen, it's not the most accurate thing in the world. I'm like, but when I'm in the middle of the woods and I don't have a scale, it gets me, you know, within a percent, within reason, you know, what this deer weighs out, you know, dressed and not dressed. Right. And then I can go back and if you got a scale. So, you know, mark those things down because that's all data that as you go and as you said, going into year two and identify, you've identified those limiting agents and you're starting to course correct. Now you can start saying, hey, I've really got to put weight on these individuals on my property. Is it more beneficial for me to manage early succession, successional habitat for my food source? Is it beneficial for me to put food plots in? Like, what is it, right? So mm -hmm. the more data, just getting people used to, and people can follow you on all the stuff that you've published over the years, which is, my God, a lot of stuff, you know, out there to where, it, you know, you can just get that data. You can look and see what other people are doing to say, hey, this is how we're building food sources. This is how we're building habitat resources as far as cover and things like that. So, you know, I I, I want to thank you for coming on. I, I, you know, wanted to get out of this what I got out of it, you know, talk about the kind of the old days of deer management because I don't think people hear that history too much because, you know, quite honestly, there's not a, I mean, well, there is a lot of people out there that have been around there, but as far as known people that are easy to get a hold of and reach out to and that are social and things like that there's not a it's a it's a lower percentage that's out there that where we can get that resource as far as what it's like back then where we've come from today you know and everything like that so how can people get a hold of you you know those of you who don't know you you're all over what are the main yeah ways? just 
Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you again for letting me be your guest. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. And just search on Growing Deer on any of the platforms or media, whatever you yep. use. Just search on Growing Deer, you'll find us. Yep, and I'll have links to everything in the show description. So I want to thank you for coming on, and I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. And like usual, we'll look forward to seeing you all next time. All right, everybody, that wraps up another episode here at the Hunt Signs Podcast. I want to thank everybody for checking out today's video. If you liked today's episode, go ahead and hit that subscribe button if you have not already done so. It's easy. You can click right here. It's going to subscribe you to the page. Of course, if you like today's video, also help us out by giving us a like, by hitting the thumbs up button, and of course, hitting that bell notification so that way you can be updated on all the future episodes and future content that we put out here on the channel. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. We can't wait to see you guys again on the next one. Until then, everyone, thank you for checking out the Hunt Signs podcast, and we'll see you next time.